The Tefl Commute, Season 10, Episode 2, Recipes, in which we talk about all things food and teaching. Are you ready? Off we go. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> How's it going, Sean? We're back again. We are, yeah, yeah, we are. It's, it's just been a long day. <laughs> just... It has indeed. Um, maybe not for our listeners, though. If you're listening to this, welcome to the Tefl Commute. This is a podcast uh, for language teachers. And the topic of teaching mm-hmm. will come up today, just to save you trying to torture. The, okay. the, the, yes, <laughs> all right. Each episode, we take a we take a topic and we do a little bit of a dive into it and how it may relate to teaching. Today's topic is recipes. I'm your host, Lindsay Clanfield, and I'm joined by me, Sean Wilden, the other host. Recipe for ah, okay. So we're starting already. The recipe. Um, Recipe for disaster is the thing that I always uh, think of first. Yeah, me too. And I was, I found that very interesting because we both, when we when we met to say what the episode is, we both went recipe for disaster. But you know how they say Google acts as kind of a corpus? I put in a recipe for just to see what it would auto fill at the end. Disaster was nowhere near the near it. I got- it's weird because I, when I looked up in the idioms dictionary, the only frequent idiom or the only idiom they kind of talk about is a recipe for disaster. So go on. Then what? 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 Well, what does top, recipe? Well, the top five in my Google search, and I used and I used inc- inc- incognito and uh, and a VPN. So because I search for a lot of recipes because I like cooking, yeah. So I, okay. I, didn't want, I thought in case I altered it anyway. So I used to, I used incognito uh, incognito mode and a VPN, and it came up with a recipe for death, <laughs> a recipe oh for my. life, a recipe for success, and then a recipe for apple pie. <laughs> so, wow, a recipe for success I would get. Yeah, a recipe for apple pie would be weird. A recipe yeah. for death it sounds an odd. A one. recipe for death. Yeah. It must. It must be a movie or a Netflix show or something like that. You think? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to go beyond it because I didn't want to influence the influence what I was. You know, of course, it remembers everything you do. But yeah, no, I was yeah. just. I was. I was gobsmacked that recipe for disaster. It seemed to me it's that natural when you you mentally fill in the end of the idiom, don't you? A recipe for yeah. A recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yes, that's a recipe for disaster. Well, let's hope this. Uh, let's hope this. Uh, this I put this. Uh, this version of this uh, podcast isn't. <laughs> Is it? Isn't that? Um, so recipes. What we we thought about recipes because in fact it is such a frequent thing that happens with with teaching and English teaching especially. Um, so what we wanted to talk about a little bit about recipes for food, but then how the recipe concept also goes into teaching and how popular it is because I think both of us found um, instinctively when we said an episode on recipes, we both kind of thought, ah, yes, this would work perfectly in ELT because recipes are such a part of, of language teaching. Um, but let's start with like the actual, the, the, the first meaning of recipes as in food recipes. Um, I mean, and the, I want to... an unbelievable. Uh, I mean, if you if you're going to say one guaranteed topic, you know, if your life depended on guessing what was in a course book, you'd have to go for recipes. That, a recipe there, wouldn't you? I mean, they are so common. I, yes. Well, you know, the, I, although not. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if they are as common now. Ah, ah good point. Um, and I have some stuff that I have some stuff to share about that later. Uh, but okay. let's. I mean, let's first talk about. Well, why don't why don't we uh, let me start by asking you a question? Right. As a cooking, when you cook, Sean, do you follow a recipe, or do you ever use it as a guide, or do you never use a recipe? Uh, can I? Where's the answer D? All of the above. All of the okay. So <laughs> I think I, I, why? I, I, yeah, when I, and I, why? I yeah. So there are some things that I instinctively, and I, I, and I do think it parallels to teaching. There are some things I instinctively do. That I know because yep. I've done it so many times, I, I don't need to look at it. Uh, I would say if I was doing something new and it was complicated, then I would probably uh, use the recipe. 
uh, like okay. more strictly follow the recipe in order to hopefully achieve what it was. But then, it, then next time I made it, or subsequent times I made it, I would probably use it more as a guide or an, a, 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 a kind of adapt it in a way, which I think is, is true for teaching. I think that's where you, well, that's where you're going to go with it, isn't it? I think it is where you're going to go because you could it's sort of like the. It's so interesting. My son, my 18 year old son, is learning how to cook, and he insists on following a recipe but a recipe that someone he knows has written down for him right so if i say oh yeah use this in the book he won't kind of do that but if i write down do this do that do the other without you know sort of very shorthand then he'll be like okay now i'll do that or if his mom does it or if somebody else in the family it's, hands it's interesting my dad who, but my dad who likes cooking as well he he will never not follow the recipe even though he knows how to make it, he just, I mean, he's just so instinct. He, he has to follow the recipe because he does my head in. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> it's just like, but you know how to make this. Oh, yeah, but this recipe, you know, it's kind of, he sees it. He's, yeah. he's more of a, he's from a more of a science background than science mathematical background than I am. But so I, but I, I also remember my mum with certain dishes, she would follow the recipe religiously. And if she, if there wasn't an ingredient, then she would sort of stop and say, well, no, I didn't do it because we didn't have. Uh, you know, uh, an ingredient that I would think, well, you could substitute it for something else. I think as, else. An, as an expat uh, ELT teacher for many years, I've learned to substitute ingredients. <laughs> yes, that's true. But so, I mean, I guess in a way, I one of my questions was, do you think that people teach in the way that they cook? Like, does, does are there some people, I, I guess, because of, often people talk about the course book or activities, you know, whether or not you follow it religiously, the instructions to the letter. And uh, I, I kind would, of get yeah. really stuck if you don't have an element. If like if the if the exercise says now take this or use this bit of the video, and you're like I don't have the video, so I'm not going to use anything from this lesson or so on. Or are, are there some people who never want to follow or who, if, if the person who hates following a course book? Are they the same kind of person who hates following a recipe book? I wonder. There's a whole research project in there for you, Lindsay. I think, but I would, but, but but don't we don't uh, don't we actually. Uh, don't we encourage in a certain way with teacher training courses to follow a recipe and in, in a certain extent to a certain extent i think um basic lesson plans i might i'm just worried yep. i might get shot down are very recipe like especially if you're going to teach a skills lesson a receptive skills lesson especially you know it's kind of like uh and of course books follow that you know like pre-teach the vocabulary uh do the do the the skin yes. do the more exactly. detailed i mean in, in essence that's a recipe isn't it yeah. And I, I think the other thing we were both thinking about was the quantity of uh, resource books for teachers that are kind of considered like recipe yeah. books. There was a couple of really famous ones in the 80s called Recipes for Tired yeah, Teachers. Yeah, yeah, Did you, yeah. you ever remember that? I, that was uh, written. I, I was looking for it. And I got sworn I own a copy of it because it's one of the first books I ever got given as a teacher. Yes, I was given it as well. It was from 1986, I think. Uh, and it's from um, the Pilgrims okay. teachers. It's yeah. teachers associated with Pilgrims language courses in Canterbury. And uh, it's called Recipes for Tired Teachers. Well, seasoned activities for the ESOL oh, classroom. Oh, look at the pun they got um, in there as well. That is a good and well-seasoned, nice one. I know, uh, I know, yeah. yes. Very yeah, nice, yeah. very nice. And and what's interesting is the um, the, the these recipes, this book of recipes for tired teachers, the format of it is so familiar to so many teachers if you've ever used other resource books you know it's always begins with like materials and, you know so you have your ingredients you have the materials that you need for the activity um you may have time that the activity uh takes then the procedure and it's kind of listed out like a red like first do this then do this then mix this then put in this and so on and so forth so i find it very interesting that the whole the format of the recipe or like sometimes in the other, they'll say language functions or whatever, language point, time required, um, materials needed, you know, none. Well, or yeah, one copy I, of I, this did, thing. I guess it, I've never thought about it as a recipe, but it is, it's kind of, that's the way a lesson plan works as well, isn't it? So you could argue, therefore, extending that metaphor that, that, uh, that a lesson plan in itself is a recipe. Yeah, but, yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I'm sat here looking. You, you, you started with recipes to try teacher. I'm sat here flicking through a copy of "Keep Talking" by Friedrich Klippel, which I think oh. you know it was one of the first recipe books I had published first in 1984. And I'm just looking at the page. I just don't know when I got this book, but it's really, really old. The pages are, are browning in it uh, as we speak. 
Oh, so would you say that that's your favorite recipe? I wouldn't say, for I wouldn't say it, it's got a lot of nostalgia for me. I, am, I wouldn't say it's my favorite recipe book. Uh, I've got yeah. I've got stacks of them. I realized, you know, in preparation for this, I was looking at my bookshelf, how many recipe books I've got. I mean, this. I think that that one as well, and any teachers listening who know this uh, well-known book, Keep Talking by Klippel, the original version, it looks like a recipe as well. Like when you see the pages. Yeah, absolutely. The format looks like it. Yeah, yeah, been, uh, what are the headings that they have on these? Because they have lots of headings, well, don't they, they? they? I mean, each one is the name of the activity. So, so I'll open it randomly. So you've got like uh, 84, the 84 activity, I'd rather be. And then just as, as you said, you've got like the aims, the level, the organization, the prep time, the procedure procedure uh for it so would you rather be soft or hard glass or wood water or what soft or hard you can't ask that that's rude <laughs> oh, oh, the book down quickly uh yeah but i don't i think recipe books are really interesting i just think about myself i would set myself a challenge a few years ago going through of because obviously uh, like as you know i'm a, a a techie kind of teacher and a lot of the recipe books i think i think recipe books went out of fashion there was a lot of them and i think they're coming back into fashion now uh um, yes but i think there was a period where they went out of fashion and i was very saddened uh, i think when there was the uh, resource books for teachers says by uh OUP went out uh, with with they said they weren't going to publish it anymore. And I went through it because they're dated to see how many of the recipe, how many of the recipes you can update with tech, and that's quite an interesting thing to do. Go through your old books, your old yeah. recipes, and, and see if the new techniques work with them. I guess you know, in cooking terms, can you sous vide it? Um, uh. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think also. I mean, I think the reason why lots of the recipe books they had that period. I think it was in the sort of early two thousand and tens where people were saying they're they're going to die out they won't happen anymore i think it was because at that point it was when everyone was beginning to blog a lot and so you had this big um explosion in the blogosphere of uh teachers sharing their recipes you know sort of so everything could just be crowdsourced i remember hearing conversations yeah. at publishers saying we're not going to do it anymore because all of this is being shared online and yet yes. still they've started to make a comeback yeah but i think there's a couple of things i also i um i agree with that but also there was a period around the same time when actually because recipes became well i don't know maybe it was just me i used you use a recipe book uh, to kind of augment your course book didn't you you think you, you kind yeah. of looked for for a supplement or something different or warm or a filler and i think for a while as well the successful course books were coming out with their own extra material. So you didn't need That's recipes, true. you know, like I think of the rewards, yes. areas, for example, where, you know, everybody knows of those photocopyable resources. Uh, we've That's true. That has many times about communication games and those kind of things. And I think as the, uh, the, uh, there was a period where those courses, not only they put in all the photocopyables in the teacher's notes as well, they yeah. would have, here's an extra fun activity. Here's an extra yeah. thing you yeah. can do. So, so the, 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 they wanted to become like the Uber cookbook of the course, like everything in one spot, you don't need anything else. Everything would be in there. So but that probably also I mean, explains uh, why. And a nod, and I know you, you're involved in like the, the ones the most recent ones, I guess, are the Etipedias, which have which yes. taken a different. Uh, kind of they're not recipes per se they're more like here are things you can do uh, yes. with it but they are but their the heart lies in the old recipe the, the recipe book I would say uh, very much very much so very much so they're just much much briefer yeah. sort of it's almost if the recipes were on index cards as opposed yeah. to whole big yeah, pages yeah, yeah. so all of this talk of recipes is making me a bit hungry shall we take a break <laughs> Yes. Oh, uh, oh, let's take a break because I want to bring back something that we've done in previous seasons. Are you ready for some angels? Oh, why don't we hear the angels? That sounds like a recipe for something nice. And now it's time for this week's teaching philosophy from a Facebook meme. If your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees. If your plan is for 100 years, educate children. Ah. Uh, <laughs> we both said it at the I same know, time. I know, I love the angels. I miss the angels. I was so happy that Facebook has started putting up loads of uh, spurious philosophy. Yes, again. I, but, I wonderful, but, wonderful but, stuff. But, Keep it up, teachers. Yes, Keep sharing keep that sharing Facebook, those memes. It gives us some Facebook some, philosophy. But, uh, um, yeah. Um, what's an ELT? I, you know you're, you get a BLT. Uh, when I when when I was start, when I when I started when I started researching for this episode, it's like looking at what was on there. I put 
put in, I think my first search was something like recipes plus ELT, you know, and I was, yeah. I was given a recipe for an ELT sandwich. <laughs> I was like, I've never oh my it. gosh! Uh, what was in the ELT oh, sandwich? Is ELT. that just eggs, lettuce, and tomato? Yeah, eggs, lettuce, and tomato. I've, I've never <laughs> called it an ELT sandwich, but no, uh, it's a BLT, yeah, a yeah, bacon, lettuce, yeah, and tomato. Yeah. But there you go, an ELT, yeah, an ELT sandwich. sandwich. There you go. Um, I did a little bit of research on recipes. As language teachers, it's always interesting to think about the language of things as well. And there has been stuff written about um, linguistic features of recipes. Um, I actually found one, uh, like, 176-page master's thesis on linguistic features of recipes, which was quite funny because there was a whole bunch that said, you know, one thing to note about recipes, there are lots of nouns used in recipes. Nouns for food words. <laughs> I'm sort of like, oh, okay. Really? What a scintillating <laughs> conclusion to draw from well, such well, a master's also thesis. Also, verbs for cooking involved. <laughs> Yes, exactly. What other linguistic features would you suggest are there in recipes? Apart from cooking verbs and nouns for food, what would you say also is a linguistic feature of recipes which makes them useful bits of language to study in class? You said that they are always a recipe. Well, yeah, course, I think you what else I mean, would there I mean, be? I I'll like probably... You said um, they're, they're perhaps gone out of fashion, which is true. But I think they do still appear in, in perhaps in more lower level um, course books. I know yeah. part of that is because it's such a piece of an easy piece of language. You're dealing with verbs tend to be in the infinitive imperative, so imperative form. You know, cut us up, do that yep. uh, with it. Um, and of course, it's a good way of sequencing language. Uh, yes, yes. So there are th so there's lots of verbs. You've got all your cooking verbs: your cut, slice, bake, etc. You've got all the the food words. Then you've got your good use of connectors. So first do this, then do this. After that, do this. So that's also good and very simple connectors often, um, like and and but um, as well. But not sort of comp you never get like moreover and nevertheless. <laughs> That wouldn't be in a recipe. Whip, whip the cream until it's then, then it's then run more over. I've just, I've just, yes. I, I should, uh, in case anybody complains, a, a, a ELT sandwich can also stand for eggplant bacon rather than bacon. Eggplant Ooh, bacon. Nice. Egg, I can't say it now. Eggplant bacon, lettuce, and tomato. There you go. Um, uh, yes, no, there is lots of uh, language. Uh, there's another one as well, which are partitives. I, I had to just double check myself what a partitive was, a but partitive. I, I think. I think it, <laughs> A partitive, yes, of course. Things like a pinch of salt, a carton ah. of milk, a, a, a whatever of whatever, a something of something. So there are lots of good ones of those examples. And interestingly, in this same uh, thesis, they talked about the register and how register could vary enormously depending on the course book. And they had like certain course books which were very informal. So they used you like now your 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 bread will be too um will will not rise if you don't do this. And then other ones which are more formal saying the bread will not rise unless it is and then using more passive okay. construction. So it really depended the register would depend on that. So there wasn't sort of one single register for 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 recipe books. And then other ones like more modern ones which try to be very chatty so lots of exclamation marks things like wonderful your family will love this and so on and so forth but i thought that was kind of that is interesting i guess that's reflected a little bit in real life as well because um cookbooks carry the voice of their chef or whatever the you know especially if they're related to yeah. a famous chef or a product of that so they're yeah. written in that kind of style so exactly i guess there's a real life feature yeah, yeah, yeah. there with it you did mention course books uh, and recipes and mm. course books. And it reminded me of, uh, I think this was around um, 10 years ago. I was I was lucky enough to host one of the first or the first ever Pecha Kucha at Ayatafel. So the, these are like these mini mm. presentations that became quite popular at conferences. And I remember one of the most funny ones I ever saw in my life was Scott Thornbury did a Pecha Kucha on food and recipes and course books. Um, and Scott Thornbury is well known for collecting old course books. He had food lessons and recipe lessons from 1923 up to 2007. And he did this wonderful Pecha Kucha where he talked about how food had changed in course books and how the early course books, often the food, very British, lots of 
things like um, you know uh, roast beef and, and and things like that. Um, he has amazing ones where part of the language then the recipe and the, the food units also includes things like the butler, the sideboard, the cruet, the mustard pot. What you're um, telling me you don't have a mustard then, pot? <laughs> Well, oh, yes, okay. of course you do. I have well, a I thought this was the end of the podcast but, um, then, you know, that's it. There was a fantastic, he also said how how the language for the recipes was very odd. So it didn't didn't conform to the language stuff we were saying just before about a recipe. Here's an example that I, I remember from his, I've got it written down here, of a 1954 course book on um, making tea, but but it's written as a series of steps. And it says, Mrs. Black is going to make tea for herself and her husband. What will she do? She will go to the kitchen. She will take the kettle to the cold water tap. She will take the lid off the kettle. She will hold the kettle under the tap, turn the water on and fill the kettle. Then she will turn the water off. Um, look at the second picture. What has she done? She has filled the kettle with water and she has put it on the gas stove. She has turned the gas on. She has struck a match and lit the gas. So here you've got this sort of pseudo yeah. recipe thing for making tea, which is using like, which is to try to shoehorn the structures. Of it. It quite, the quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. To totally what they, we would call in the biz input yeah. flooding. So this was totally in input. Um, uh, input flooded. And then he has these hilarious ones from 1979 from a book, uh, I think it's Streamlines, which is Guests for Supper. And you see this couple there opening wine. Oh, um, yes, yes. yes, and it says... Yeah. Hello, you're Paul, aren't you? What's the matter? You look miserable. And Paul says, we're making potato salad and we haven't got any mayonnaise or parsley or lemon. And then Sue says, that's all right. I'm on a diet. And then Barbara says, I hate potato salad. So that's fine. Here, I've got some wine. Let's have a glass. <laughs> and they're all opening the, they're all like sort of fighting over the wine and laughing. It looks hilarious. And then the best part of this Pachacucci was that in this potato salad, which had the recipe for it, this Danish potato salad, Scott made it. And he showed all these photos of him making this 1979 <laughs> English language Danish potato salad with the wine. And oh, very, very funny, so. I guess, yeah. Now, um, if you often set the homework for, go on, go make the recipe and bring it next week and then nobody ever does it but yeah i mean the other interesting thing he said is that how food and recipes changed according to the times so now he said as english from 1992 to 2005 became more sort of international it ceased to be cool to kind of put old-fashioned english stuff and you get these global uh recipes so recipes for green curry or for sushi rolls or onion soup or nachos and things like that so as english becomes international that must be reflected in the food and the recipes and the course books mm, yeah very much which I, which I thought was also interesting we're back again and and this this I'm going to finish. I thought we could finish our little uh, episode today on recipes, where um, where I was mentioning before how Scott had looked at old course books um, from the 1920s and 50s and the recipes in there, and they were very traditional British food. I thought since I am uh, a Canadian, a Canuck, and you are a Brit, an authentic, uh, what I did is I went <laughs> online and looked up the most traditional British foods, and I've taken extracts from uh, recipes for them. So what I wanted to do is I'm going to read to you a bit of a recipe, an extract from a recipe, and I want you to guess what traditional English dish is being described. Is it English? Don't interrupt. English or British? Yeah, uh, actually, no, sorry. I should. No, not just English. British. Okay. Okay, so British. Um, uh, but let, let, let me finish, though, so that our listeners can also guess what I am describing. Okay, these are traditional British dishes. I'm only giving you a part of the recipe, so like a stage from in the middle of the recipe. Okay? Yes, sir. Ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, let me finish before you guess that. Yes, sir. Okay? All right, sir. One, give the rested batter a stir and pour it into the really hot tin over the sausages. Take care as it may spit. Quickly sprinkle over the sage leaves and rosemary, then place in the middle of the oven. Cook until puffed up and brown, and the batter is completely cooked through. Serve straight from the dish. I, what traditional English dish am I talking about here? You're talking about toad in the hole, surely. <laughs> oh yes, there we go. Got it. I, I went. I went deep there on the first one. So toad in the hole. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. 
All right, ready this. Some of these I didn't even know. They're ready this next one. Okay. I'm ready. Go. I'm on a roll. <laughs> Put the sausage meat, pepper, ham, stuffing, and herbs in a small bowl. Mix to combine, then divide into four equal balls. Squash one of the balls between a piece of cling film until it is as flat as possible. One at a time, lightly flour each cooked egg, then use the cling film to help roll the meat around the egg to completely encase it. Repeat with the main, remaining sausage balls and eggs. <laughs> I mean, I was, I, when he started that, I was like, what? And sausage meat, pepper and ham. Who does pop, Who puts all that into it? I know what the answer is. I'm just querying the recipe. Um, yeah. it's, um, it's scotch eggs. Yes, of course. There's more to it than that. I'm not giving you the whole yeah, recipe. No, but, I'm just I mean, giving I'm, a teeny pepper, bit. Uh, ham, ham, and I just, why would you have sausage meat and ham in it? It's a bit odd. Oh, I, no idea. I just I'm, that's it's what odd, the to be honest. I it's you, what the BBC said. So I, the first one was black pudding around them. They're much nicer with black pudding around them. <laughs> toad in the hole. The second one was a Scotch egg. Yeah. Here's number three. All right. Lightly butter the wheat bread with butter. Layer the tomatoes ham and rocket leaves on one slice add the chunky pickle add the other slice on top and enjoy you're making i think there's something missing from this you're not anyway. making a sandwich well it is but it's a kind of sandwich i don't know because i never eat tomato so i have no idea what okay it. well w what if i said put a big slice of cheddar cheese in there as well and the oh, chunky sorry. Pickle. is it a tomato and ham sandwich no oh. No, the no. chunky pickle. The chunky pickle. No idea. The plowman's rubbish. <laughs> well, this is what it said. I'm going to from like take a British traditional pub. British pub Who has food. A plow a plow what a plowman's lunch has a bit of pork pie and a bit of Stilton and a bit of cheddar. So it says a plowman sandwich. No, this is what it said. Never heard of it. <laughs> Go on. Any more? Fine. Okay. All right. Next one. Go on. Then. Put the minced meat into an oven-proof dish. Top with the mash hang on, and hang ruffle on, hang on, with hang a on. fork. Important, important consideration here. What type of mincemeat? Because it will affect the answer. Uh, I, I think it was lamb okay, and right, beef. Right. Lamb and beef. Well, or lamb no, or beef, I mean, but anyway. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell you, can Top you. with the mash and ruffle with a fork. Bake for 20 to 25 minutes until the, until the top is starting to color and the mince is bubbling through at the edges. Uh, well, this is where the this is where the mince is important because if it's lamb, you're making a shepherd's pie. But if it's not, ah. if it's beef, you're making a cottage pie. Ah, okay. Well, there I stand corrected. I didn't check. I copy pasted from a shepherd's pie recipe. Ah, yeah. Well, so yeah, it's only lamb then. It would be okay. Now this one I also copy pasted, and I've forgotten what it is. So I'm hoping <laughs> you'll remember because I can't find the page anymore. Oh, but I have the recipe, and this one is a bit harder. Okay, I think it is. All right, ready. Yes, sir. Wash the seaweed and rinse in clean water several times. Over a low heat or in a slow cooker, simmer the seaweed for six hours until it turns into a dark pulp. Combine the seaweed, olive oil, lemon juice, and seasoning and stir through. Toast the bread, then butter to taste. Spoon the seaweed mix onto the host hot toast and serve immediately. I know what it is now. Ah, uh, it's nice you put something in for uh, for one of our other presenters who's Welsh. Uh, it's lava bread, isn't it? I think. Yes, it's lava, lava, bread. lava bread. Yeah, lava bread, which is made with seaweed, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. supposed to be. They call that the the Welsh caviar. Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it in Welsh. It's barrel barrel law or something like that. But yeah. All right. Well, there you go, everyone. I wonder if any of you did as well as Sean. Uh, if there are also disagreements about uh, about what a plowman sandwich is, maybe there are. I will. I will just <laughs> plead ignorance as a North American. Uh, well, this uh, will person, stop. Person from the colonies. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, fair I think enough. that probably brings us to an end of our episode today. What do you think? Well, I'm hungry now <laughs> i think i am too but all right all right good to, thank you for that quiz i should i guess it's my uh, turn next time then we'll be putting links to all the stuff that we shared here in our at our website you can find out that and more information about us at tefelcommute.com um if you like this episode please tell all your friends they can find it wherever they find their podcasts and on spotify um where else can people contact us sean well the control you said the blog podomatic spotify 
Spotify, YouTube, we're pretty much everywhere. Facebook, <laughs> you, you can't, yes, you can't you can, avoid it. You can send us a message on Facebook uh, and uh, let us know what you've done with recipes or if there are any recipes you think uh, are, are, are always a success in class. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Now that your commute is coming to an end, here is an idea you can take into class. We came across this activity on the ELT Planning blog, which can be found at eltplanning.com. It's an idea that uses recipes as a topic, and we really like it as it deals with both speaking and listening. It also uses QR codes, which I really love to use in class. The ELT Planning website has all the materials ready for you to download and use. However, if you want to make your own lesson, then this is what you need to do. First, go to YouTube and find some chefs making uh, one of their recipes. For each video of chefs you want to use, copy the URL. Once you have the URLs, go to a site that makes QR codes, and we've put some of those on the website for you to link to, and make a QR code for each video. Print these out, and for the lesson, put them around the room. At the start of the lesson, ask the students to take out their notebooks and write down dish name, ingredients, and difficulty. Now, they should take out their phones, go to a QR code, scan it, and watch the video. Noting down what they learn about the dish name, the ingredients, and how difficult it is to make. They should repeat this until they've watched all the videos, and then you should group the students together so they can discuss their answers. As a follow-up, you could ask the students which of the dishes they would most like to cook or eat, and also what they might choose if they were to make a video of a recipe. Our thanks go to Pete Clements for letting us share the activity and you can find the instructions, the link, etc. for this activity on our website, which is tefelcommute.com. You've been listening to the Tefl Commute, a podcast produced and presented by Lindsay Clanfield, Sean Mulden and James Taylor. Don't miss out on any episodes by subscribing to us on iTunes and by visiting us at tefelcommute.com. The Temple Commute, season two. <laughs> I know we thought. Damn. All right, it's one of those days. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>